Time's expired. Uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questions, but I must add, uh, in uh, uh, Miss Katzen's description of the Reigns Act, what a noble concept, putting uh, the power of regulations in the hands of Congress. Uh, Mr. Campo, you wrote a report last September titled Regulatory Budgeting in the U.S. Federal Government, where you describe how President Trump's executive order uh, 13771 achieved a net regulatory cost savings of over $198 billion over four years. Can you explain how this was possible? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I think it was, uh, it was certainly a, a very collaborative effort uh, across the entire government, across um, the, the professional career civil service ranks and the political ranks to work together to find um, opportunities for improvements. Um, I think one sort of uh, misconception about the about deregulation is that sometimes there's an idea that oh you're just you know slashing and burning, um, but really uh, a lot of you I, may, I noted it a little bit earlier, but um, a lot of the regulatory reforms were just that reforms. We call them regulatory reform task forces. They were reforms that made improvements to programs um, that generated savings while still protecting uh, health and safety uh, and other important uh, concerns. Um, so the, uh, the architecture was that basically um, when, it, when a new regulatory, a dollar of regulatory cost was going to proceed, uh, we wanted to find a way to offset it if we could. Part of the way we did that was to direct agencies to um, build on the retrospective analysis program that the Obama administration yeah. put in place. We said, let's take that and let's implement it even further. Very good. Very good. Mr. Mulligan, my understanding is that President Trump reduced regulatory costs almost as fast as Presidents Obama and Biden added them. Can you elaborate how that was accomplished? You know, I, I was there for, for part of the time, and I, and I wonder, because we had these different things going on at the same time. You had the regulatory budget. You also had the, uh, Mr. Pai at the FCC. He was not part of the regulatory budget, but he still deregulated. So. And then you had other leaders like Scott Gottlieb who somehow had just a personal touch where he was able to expedite the work at FDA and make it uh, go faster. So I, I think it's worth understanding how, how it was done, and we, we can see the results. Absolutely. You know, my Democrat colleagues are complaining about uh, efforts by Republicans to change the regulatory environment with respect to airline pilot shortages or with respect to uh, heavy truck emissions when we have a supply chain crisis or uh, Dodd-Frank bank regulations uh, reform because we have fewer banks, higher fees, uh, and we have created a situation because of Dodd-Frank of banks that are too big to fail. So. Mr. White, I'm concerned that some of the biggest new Biden regulations fly in the face of the Supreme Court's decision last year in West Virginia versus EPA. This is an important issue in my district, a big coal district. Do you share that concern? I do, Congressman. The, the recent decisions out of the Supreme Court, including the ones regarding the major questions doctrine, they're not silver bullets, they're not panaceas, they're not going to stop every agency in its tracks on every rulemaking, but they are, these decisions are important for the most significant transformative agency actions, and we live in a time, uh, in a moment, where agencies have a lot of significant transformative actions they want to undertake. So if, if the Biden administration continues to resist compliance with the court's ruling, what could the consequences be? Well, that's, that's a hard question to answer because there's outright defiance of court orders, which I, I don't expect. But what I do think you could see is a lot of soft resistance to Supreme Court decisions and lower court decisions, which is much harder for courts to monitor on a case-by-case -case basis. It makes congressional oversight, congressional Congress's legislative and appropriations powers all the more important. You know, I have to clarify something for the record. My, many of my Democrat colleagues have, have made statements that say re Republicans don't support regulations. We support common sense regulations. We, we always need to examine and evaluate and seek input on burdensome and costly regulations. And I think that's what we have uh, with this Biden administration. There's no input from the private sector. Uh, you have unelected bureaucrats that continue to make uh, enormous regulatory decisions that have a huge impact, not just on uh, private industry, but on consumers. 
We have a, a huge inflation crisis in America right now, and we believe that many of the burdens, uh, many of the burdens and regulations by the Biden administration, particularly in the energy industry, have led to an inflationary environment that's having a, a devastating impact on consumers. Uh, before I yield to the next questioner, I ask unanimous consent to submit these documents and statements into the record. Uh, the burden is backed by Casey Mulligan, uh, regulatory budgeting in the U.S. federal government by Anthony Campau. Uh, Campau, Camp pronounce that for me. It's Campo, sir. Campo. Don't worry. Campo. I mispronounce everything. I apologize for that. They, they, these, my members are, are used to that. But, uh, statement for the record by the National Association of Manufacturers. Statement for the record by the American Chemistry Council. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Kassar for 